Welcome. Uh, group mind mapping and brainstorm exercise. So um, I guess the goal that I was going to show you on the screen, but I can't now, is developing a robust personal strategy to deal with likely ecological, social, economic disruptions in, let's say, about 20 to 30 years from now. A cheery and pleasant topic, as any. <laughs> no, but well, extremely important, right? So and I think that's all of us are here with that idea that, okay, we know climate change is real, that there's going to be some unpleasant things. You can either ignore it or you can try to, like any other threat, start dealing with it and think about preparing it because any step you take now is a step we won't hurt. So what I would like to do is, I, I'm assuming, let's just start with that, I'm assuming you, we are all familiar with the basic climate change stuff, right? So, but let me just quickly summarize. We're thinking, if you look at the science, um, increasingly severe weather. So usually, wherever you live, imagine what you have, but then worse. So climate change means more intense oscillations, higher, uh, higher highs, lower lows, uh, shit being more frequent, stuff like that. In some extreme cases, plausible that things flip into very different weather patterns. If you're in a very, very wet area, it might become very dry. These things are possible, but for the sake of our sanity, let's keep it in the more extreme thing. So what I would like to do as a first step is to imagine that 20 to 30 years, just kind of think for yourself, okay, where am I, you know, how old am I? Because we're all different, right? And I'll be close to 20, 50, it'll put me close to 70, 75 even. Uh, so I'll be an old man, uh, older than now. Um, so th I might, not, you know, and. I see younger people as well. For you, you might be later when I'm adult, might be then. Uh, so imagine yourself, you're there and what's outside the window? What do you see? And I know we've come from different places. So if you're in a, if you live in Switzerland, you will see different things around you, maybe molten, um, uh, molten glaciers. You might see uh, mountains that have no vegetation because the rain has stripped them off. If you live in Holland, you might have been flooded once or twice because of too much rain. Uh, so, okay, just for the physics, for the those that are the, from the Netherlands, the expectation, the, the science I know is 2050, don't worry about it. This is the last place you want to worry about flooding sea level. Because we are obviously at a very low place. If you look at the specifically Dutch situation, the level of protection we have, institutional systems in place, and the physical, everything we got, we'll find for the next 150 years is three, four, five meters, we'll be fine. Yeah, it's not a good... But it costs a lot. Oh, the, 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 I'm stri strictly physical, I'm, I'm saying from the physical perspective, you, you will not likely be flooded in Holland from the sea. You will, however, be much more likely flooded by rain. Yes, Think Dutch. the human population actually lives very close to the I sea. Fully understand, and that's not, but my point is try to think of where you live, because we're trying to think about strategies, what do I do now? Because I cannot help Bangladesh directly right now. They're fucked no matter what badly. Indonesia, Indonesia and, and you don't want to be in Miami either, all of those places. But I'm not there and that's not, I can't control that. I do live minus four and a half meters below sea level in a polder. So for me, rain, for example, local is a huge problem. If the pumps that evacuate my polder are broken, I am going to swim. So I would like to collect from, oh, just think about it. What kind of weather, what do I have today and what do I think can you, you know, use one or two, three words so we can group them together to see what do we, what is the range of things we might expect, right? So I'll just give you a couple of minutes and then uh, just kind of wave and I'll collect your sticky note and I'll start sticking it up. Um, Claudia, do you have um, a mask? Can you, no, can you cut me some? Um, so I can pick these things up in a second. Sorry, I'm just not awake. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. okay. So I'll add here, this is stiffed. Okay. And also 
think think about the, the what's your not just weather but also what kind of biological environment am I in? Am I close to forests? Am I in the am I for example in the um, farming fields or so what? Farming. Farming land, do I live around farming land? What that might mean for me, that's let's say if I'm in a clay area and it's gonna be raining like mad all the time. Or I'm on sand and maybe there is torrential rains. What if I am in an environment where uh, if the winter goes extreme and it freezes like hell for three weeks or four weeks, it doesn't fall. Right. Again, just thinking about where am I doing, you know, what do I see now, what is the shitty weather I really hate? Imagine it times ten. And then five times a year, not once. Every five years. Because that's the order man will be talking about at like this time frame. So next ten thirty years. Beyond that, nobody really knows. Right. What do I expect in terms of what do I expect in terms of birds and the bees? Do I still is that something I care? Posterity, I'll start grouping and you shout if you don't agree, right? If like, no, no, because I want to reduce the number to a manageable sort of clusters of things. 
let's see if it's possible. I'll just randomly start grabbing. We have drought. That is clear. Um, what do you mean by drought? Whoever wrote that? Not enough available fresh water on uh, agricultural fields. Aha, uh -huh, so you meant something more, much more specific, OK? So drought specifically agri-food, OK? I have natural resource extension supply chain breakdowns. I will park supply chains because I want to have that with the more economic side of things. Um, floods, pollution, plastic toxins, normal, oh, excellent. So this is floods. Let's put drought there, floods there. What's here, I think very interesting here is the, the link to the toxics, right? There was the, one of the side effects of Brexit at some point was, oh, now we have the waste processing for manure is backed up because normally it goes to Holland, now it stays to the UK, and now they're having these spillovers of basically raw animal sewage going into the waters because they just can't deal with it. And this is a kind of thing where once you start flooding, and we've seen that in New Orleans with the last flood, it's dead cows and gasoline and oil refineries being flooded, and you do not want to swim in that. Right. So this is interesting. So I like this one. So we have flood and we have pollution. So that's a very interesting one. And how do you then deal with the crap? Let's say you have a garden and now it's been has a layer of toxic mud. Awesome. Uh, extreme heat, less trees than now. Okay, so uh, keep it with the drought. So we have the high temperatures, droughts. Climate refugees, I will park as social. Super rapid, the biodiversity loss. Okay, bio, let's keep the bio together. Bio is, what does that mean for you? Whoever wrote that one? Diversity of species. Mm. Yeah, but what, what does it mean, mean for us? It's not me. I'm Where sitting at home in my garden and going. Again, a supply chain thing. So this is, is this food? It cascades into everything, yeah. Okay, so this is, I will add here sort of food and then the rest. And this is at least the thing that, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about systems scientifically, and it's all, we get that, but then what the fuck does that mean, right? And that's the, hard, that's the hard part. How do you bring it down? Fewer insects, fewer fruits, fewer Right, fruits. and then we'll keep this one. Please do remember this because we'll come back at the economics, and then it becomes food, and it becomes justice, and it becomes, yeah, that part. More frequent extreme weather events. I'll keep it somewhere here, I guess. Um, also here, whenever you, th whoever wrote this one specifically, uh, try to think about, for your situation, what does that mean for you? Are you in a mountain? Are you uh, usually get caught by blizzards? Aha, uh -huh. what if I have non-stop blizzards for a month? Right, because then becomes, that's, that's when you can start grabbing it, because more extreme weather is like, well, whatever, right? More deserts. Lack of drinking water, I'll keep it here. I'm already depressed. Storms, OK. Um, <laughs> storms. Storms are um, insurance companies hate storms, right? They damage a lot of things. And they damage things over a wide area. I, I, I did some European projects on, on, on uh, flooding and storm damage. Floods they don't care about. Floods are local, in general. In the, in the world of uh, insurance companies. Storms come in at many hundreds of scale kilometers and hit everything. So, okay, if, if it's a storm, if you live in a flat, you have a different thing to worry about than if you own a house. We were hit in Netherlands, we had a storm in November, was it? No, when is it again? November, um, half my neighborhood lost roofs. I was, I was luckily fine, but my neighbors were not. Roofs, solar panels. Solar panels flying. Rays trees. So that means, okay, fine, if I'm preparing for, and that's clearly a short-term emergency, I have a hole in my roof, now what? Okay, so if that's a likely event, and storms are the easy, likely thing to have, what do I then do to make sure that, and we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, not pollinators, bees, food, um, put it there. Unemployment, I'll park here with economics and so sea level rise increasing something sea level rise i'll put that under the flooding 
the difficulty thing with uh, sea level rise is that you don't necessarily need to have a lot of sea level rise to start having problems. It's not necessarily about I'm going to have permanent water up to here, but even a little bit more water will allow uh, much more frequent. If you go to the Pacific Islands, the atolls. Right. You don't erosion, right? So that's co also coupled with storms because these things are nasty, especially Dutch coast is sensitive to that. Also here, when you, whenever you think for yourself, wh what does it mean for me? It really depends where you are, right? And because of the social and physical systems involved. In the Netherlands, this is the least of my worries in terms of flooding, which is weird enough because we are so extremely well prepared. In the Netherlands, Sorry. In the Netherlands we, we always bring sand to the beach. Yes. We bring lots and lots, millions of tons uh, yes, exactly. a year, 12 million tons a year of sand to the beach. And if the sea level rises, we have to increase that and significantly. Exactly. So, uh, we have to find uh, areas where we can win sand. Uh, the, 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 the ships uh, are really uh, using a, a lot of energy. Yeah. Um, we have ships uh, that, that, uh, that use uh, Always fun. A, 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 a ton of petrol an yep. hour, so uh, it, it's not nothing. And uh, also, uh, the, the, the wind uh, areas also have uh, explosives, so yep. uh, we have to see where we can win the set. So it's, it's, it's not nothing. I mean, uh, at this moment, it's okay, but. Uh, Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. So the. If you're comparing the severity of dealing with this, let's say in the Dutch, co Dutch coast where you have, I mean, the Dutch water boards are over a thousand years old institution, uh, democratic institutions. In the situation where you have that context, a high risk is probably going to be less of an impact. The same kind of situation without the institutional context, without the role, rules and the systems in place is catastrophic. And that's what makes it so hard because generally it's like, well, sure, high water is sometimes a huge problem, sometimes not as a, and that again depends, you know, if you're on French coast, just a few hundred kilometers more south, this becomes a problem because they do not have that setup because they never had to worry about it and Dutch did. So what's not to worry in Holland might be a war in the French coast. And again, depending on where you are, th try to think those things through for yourself. That's why we cannot really there's no one solution, right? It's going to be all peace wheels for your local situation within your context. Mars migration, um, a mass, I was like Mars, are we going to Mars? <laughs> Sorry, people. <laughs> There's an interesting side topic here. Um, uh, we might have uh, read the three body problem uh, science fiction book from Xixin Liu, one of the few Chinese one of the things that, uh, so it's a Chinese science fiction novel um, about how we know aliens are coming in 400 years and they're going to kill us, and now, now what? <laughs> There's an interesting point where at some point the, the world government, because at some point they have that, bans talking about leaving the planet to the point that they imply mind control to prevent that those kind of thoughts because the thought of leaving the planet is so damaging to survival. And of course, that's science fiction, but as a thought, you know, why we should not listen to Elon Musk? Because there is no planet B, and you do not want to go to Mars and be a slave to eke out existence rather than sh uh, fix your shit here. And so I thought that was a very interesting thought there. More very wet, extreme precip precipitation, more droughts. So that's kind of in between. Um, this one is interesting. Again, precipitation. Uh, Usually, what if you're on Atlantic coast, sudden uh, heat waves will bring sudden storms, will bring a lot of water very quickly, which eventually leaves, but you really need one centimeter of water in your living room to really ruin your day. Also, farming land with lots of precipitation in a very short period with very dry ground. Excellent um, point. Gets all the nutrients out of the, of, of the ground. And kills the plants and kills all of that, right. And so that means that um, there, uh, there is a whole body of literature also, uh, n not just scientific literature, but more popular on property level protection measures for flooding. You can look into that if you're interested. There's lots of very practical advices. How do I make sure that my house, if it gets flooded, is not too badly damaged? Which means moving your sockets to not there, but there, not you know, having hard floors, 
having all sorts of things. There are, there are ways you could do if you really, if this is a real threat to you. The thing here to worry about is you don't have to be flooded by sea to be in trouble. You just have to be the lowest part of your neighborhood. And this is extremely local. If you're in the Netherlands, you have the AHN, Algemene Hoogtekaart Nederland, AHN.nl, which has millimeter level accuracy of all the surfaces in the country. You can exactly look where is your garden compared to the street in terms of water, so where will the rainwater go? I look at that first before I decide buying a house, because I'm looking for a different house, because I live minus four and a half. Lowest part of The Hague, no fun. I've never been flooded yet. Uh, so if you are in a different country, check out those height maps, be prepared. If you know, you look at the map, you're like, well, but I am 20 centimeters taller than most of the street, I am probably not, don't have to worry about it with a heavy rain at some point, but if it's more than X, etc., etc. So these are very concrete local things. Extinction of species, I'll put it here with the rest. It's one of those where, like, how do you even? Food shortages, water shortage. Okay, so I'll put it in the middle because this is the less of everything. And now that's going to come back, and I think the second part is how do we learn to have less? Yes, please. Yes, please. Just saying because you said to speak from where you live. And yes, of course. Boat on any marina, so I'm trying to figure out how the sea would be or how it would affect me not having a uh, city next to me or whatever. So, yeah, so that's. Uh, right, right. So that's interesting because now this couples, of course, to the supply chains, to the infrastructure, to the older things that if you're on a boat and the bridges are bent out of shape because of heat and now you can't leave. And it's always thinking about those processes like what. When we're trying to do this, it's really about what is the obvious, never think about it stuff that I should suddenly start thinking about it because it might not work. A typical example of this in the Netherlands that I know of, uh, I live in the West, around the Hague, um, and a lot of logic there is, well, if you flood, we will just leave, right? Because, you know, we'll, right? Now, not just human where too, but how? Because the, the Hague area, to give you a sense, has three you know, highways, all of them, contain the lowest spot in the neighborhood. So the first thing that will happen is that those holes are filled with water. And nobody can leave because no single vehicle, unless you have a freaking boat in your garden, can leave the area. So the whole logic is I have a disaster, I will leave, goes out of the window as a strategy. Strategy has to be, if I'm dealing with Im immediate response to a threat, I have to stay here. Which is a whole different approach to I'll just pack up and leave. So, okay, how do I set up my emergency response to stick around, right? And it's so even the a lot of the security agencies will be like, yeah, but people will evacuate. No, they won't. They can't. Please. I lived in Rotterdam, and I thought about this. And leaving is really nice, but if everybody's leaving, nobody's leaving. Nobody's leaving. Nobody's leaving. So even if you don't have a, a spot where it's flooded, only the first ones will leave, and the rest will stay behind because they're in traffic jams. Exactly. So, and that's, you know, we know that, that's a given, so then how do I design around that? And well, how, do, how do we leave? So I don't know. Do we, do, we, do, we, do we leave by car? If you say the car is not possible, but can we leave by bike or probably? Uh, I would say you're safer on a bike. Yeah. If you're like, if you're like really, after, you know the golden rule, 72 hours before shit becomes ugly, right? You can usually survive three days. Uh, the idea is by then you're rescued or you're fucked. That's kind of the what I know at least from that literature. So 72 hours, stick on or leave. And then the question is, are you then leaving to come back? Or you're not coming back? So which scenario makes sense for your situation? Are you, do you expect, like if you're in a, those valleys in Limburg when the rains hit and your house was swept away and you just escaped, you're not coming back because you have nowhere to go to because it's gone. Now if you're in a polder, you're not going to be swept away because we don't expect torrents, uh, torrents, right? It's not going to be, uh, they're not hills, they're just going to be gross. Well, I can deal with gross, right? Because I can shovel and I can clean up and everything, but I cannot deal with a building not existing anymore. And so if you're in Limburg, that's a worry for you. It's not a worry for me personally, but, right? Um, agricultural water availability, prices, I'll keep that with prices here. How are we doing with time? Because this, I need to maybe hurry up. Half past three. Okay, let's hurry up a little bit. Heat wave, heat stroke, deaths. Okay, this is one. Uh, thanks for this one. 
Um, you're aware of the wet bulb temperature contact, uh, notion? Everybody knows about that? The wet bulb temperature? Yeah, for those that don't, wet bulb temperature is the, it's a thermodynamic phenomenon at which, that's the temperature humidity com combination at which you cannot cool something down by evaporation. Right, at, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't remember the exact details. Around 80% humidity and 35 Celsius, you will not be able to sweat yourself cool. A fit human has a few hours to live in shade because your body will simply start increasing its temperature and you will die. We have had a couple of days of that in India this year. There will be probably a few coming up in the US, in Texas this year as well. Yes, please. Um, a lot of times you see a report that the humidity is something is such and such in a place and then the temperature is such and such in a place, but if they're not at the same time of day, right. it doesn't actually mean anything because the Right. So it's a tricky one indeed. So that's, it's hard to tell. There are calculators online that will help you with that. There are measurements if you look up wet bulb temperature. But this is the one at least that makes me worried long term because if you start having periods, let's say in you know, India and places like that, tropical par parts with lots of people that are humid, if you have these con conditions for weeks on end, there will be a lot of very dead people and that's just terrifying. What, because if you cannot hide, if there is no mechanical cooling. Now, for Netherlands, is that a likely scenario? Not yet. Even outside of uh, more tropical countries, like I was worried about it in the UK for my grandma during the recent heat, heat wave, if you're elderly. You know. Excellent. Again, context. Yes. So, okay, do I, if, if I'm thinking about this prolonged heat waves, what do I do with grandma? Right? Do you have a plan for that? I literally just went to my mother-in-law and we delivered a couple of fans and wet towels to her before we left for camp because we were like, well, it's going to be hot and you were 80. But uh, one meter below ground is very cool. Obviously, that's a bad answer for grandma. <laughs> that's... <laughs> do you really want me to answer that? Okay, I have dry, uh, droughts, drying, dying woods, burning woods. This is, if you're in a forest area, yeah, that's a good point. See, I don't even think about forest fires because I'm in the middle of a freaking swamp. But if you're not, let's put that on the droughts. Um, this one is, of course, we've seen it a lot last couple of years. What's your plan for that? Do you have a, I have no idea. I mean, I always think about floods and never think about forest fires for my personal So anybody who has that context? Yeah, I mean, if you have a house, defensible space is the main thing, making sure that there's like 100 meters all around your oh. house where there's no trees or flammable bushes or anything, um, and then leaving early so that if there is a, if there's a fire and you need to leave, you want to be out of there as soon as possible so that firefighters can actually come in and right. work at least. But, but then you need to chop wood. Yeah. Back so burning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you need to do the defensible space thing way ahead of time. Yeah. You yeah. can, in California, for instance, where I used to live, if you live in the mountains, no one has, no one has like a cabin next to the forest anymore yeah. for being safe. It's, you have a cabin and then you have 100 meters of grass and then the forest is way over there because if the forest is next to your house. The forest yeah. burns your house burns. Constructed is it made of a comfort and now. Right. And what you said, just said is something you do in ahead of time. You, you don't do that while it's burning. No, you had a... Com you had a com yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Tropical countries, uh, you learn in permaculture design courses, you learn about putting banana plants uh, around. Yes. So they block the main fires. They somehow banana plants, permaculture. The excellent idea. So if you're in a situation where you can afford permaculture, for a lot of these things, probably a good idea. But that's also not something you do overnight. That's something you do years ahead. So and if you... Keep in Check. Keep burning it. in Australia is like a real thing, like for, for right. decades and decades. Uh, back burning is like really useful to contain the fires. Mm -hmm. What is back burning? Uh, the, the intentionally burning? Intentionally oh. burning a corridor. Uh, what fires are keep them? Mm -hmm. uh, what I try to say is that you, if you chop the trees, then the, the carbon storage is gone. So uh, there is, um, just to make a comment on that. Thinking across scales here is very hard. When you're talking about 100 meters of forest around your house, whatever. We need to worry about hundreds of... 
thousands of square kilometers of Amazon. We need to worry about oceans because a lot of the oxygen and all that stuff is oceans, not so much that. And there is always that trade-off, like, and I don't know how to deal with that. But there is the local um, emitting something because in the long run, or but scales are hard, and planetary scales are not something we as individuals know how to think about. You know, 16,000 kilometers, that's oh, 60,000 kilometers. That's not a quantity you can think about. Six billion people, what does that even mean, that number? Like 150, I can understand, not six billion. Yeah. I've had some more floods there, loss of nature, vegetation, high altitude forests. Yeah, that's if you're in mountains, that's the other worry. I'll add it over there. Um, I've done quite a lot of stuff on flooding and flash floods, and if you have no vegetation on mountains, flash floods will break things up really bad. Um, there's a scary paper we wrote about St. Martin and their floods, where we show how rich people push the poor people up the hills. And because they don't own the land, they're not allowed to have concrete foundations, because concrete foundations means property. Therefore, you're in a shack, and you're on a steep hill, and you get swiped away every couple of years by a typhoon. Lesson is, don't be poor. That's kind of... No. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I just get a little bit cynical, but that's the um, worst. Can, uh, uh, can somebody read what was that? Yep. Uh, urban heat islands and ah. overnight temperatures not falling low enough for recovery in places without Fantastic. Thanks for that. So uh, not everybody but is suburbanite. I keep on forgetting that because I live in burbs. If you are a city dweller, what happens, right? Overheated grid, grid goes down. If you're lucky to have air conditioning, now you have nothing. Now what? And, you, and yes, the heat island is very powerful. So, for example, I have neighbors who love concrete for some strange reasons. They have gardens full of concrete. Mine is full of wood chips, bark, and plants. My garden is literally 10 degrees cooler than theirs. And these are small things you can do. Just make sure there's no concrete around you if you can afford not to have that. And if you have, if you're in a flat, do you have plants? Do you, because living things will suck up heat. Yeah. Um, Tropical weather, okay, trees replaced by the new... Um, tropical weather trees will be replaced with the new... Species. New species, right. Um, invasive species in general, um, how much do we care? If you are exposed to kudzu, for example, in the US, and the kudzu comes and covers everything you own and kills everything, then it's a problem. In Holland... In Australia, the frogs... And frogs. The, uh, We got our crabs in Holland, but they're pretty tasty, even though you're not, you're not allowed to catch them. <laughs> Thanks for that. That's the one there was uh, a few years back. I was working at the Center of Environment in the University of Leiden, and they brought in somebody with malaria. This person was 80 years old. They have never left the country in their life. They happened to live close to Schiphol. I wonder what the fuck happened. And that was no good, because like, how do you, you know, Elephants will not stow away on planes accidentally and spread out, <laughs> right? Mosquitoes will. And so that means, okay, so fine, that's a, a, in our now swampy context, that is a real worry. Dengue, yellow fever, all those scary things, do we know to recognize it? So maybe you should just read up on it or have a little booklet somewhere in your cupboard like, oh, that's how it looks like. And if the doctor is like, I don't know what's wrong with you, well, maybe. Okay, uh, droughts, I have droughts on high sand areas, I'll put it with drought, same there. Lots of, please, uh, I, I can't read it, I'm just hoping somebody recognizes there, uh, knows what this was. So what? I can see rain, I think, but it's not mine. Anybody recognize their own sheet? Ah, lots of rain, right, so that's the, uh, where do I put that, storms, let's put on the storms, that's the same as that. We are not allowed to go outside during heavy storms. That's an interesting one, you see, this, this, this happened to me just last November with the storms. I saw my neighbor's roof fly off, and I was like, oh, I'll go outside and, you know, tell them, because they can't see the roof, I can, and my wife was like, are you fucking insane? And then she was like, and she was right, because as I was about to go outside, I see bricks falling down, because I live in a narrow alleyway. And I see bricks coming down from his roof. 
like, how about I wait for about an hour so and then go tell him? Because there's no point in getting killed while I'm trying to tell him his roof is down. They will notice the pressure change probably, but... I mean, I, he was out, you know, we were out there, but that's, there is this always, you know, how far do you reach out and, but you don't, you know, again, save yourself first, right? Because you, you can't help other people, sorry? I actually don't have his phone number, which is an excellent point socially. Do you know your neighbors? Do you have your neighbor's phone number? Yes. You do. That's smart. Who, who else has their neighbor? WhatsApp uh, neighborhood. Uh, okay, so but that's less than half. Addresses, uh, yeah, he's like two houses. He's in the back. I don't, I don't know him. And I saw, about, I saw about less than half of the hands. Lesson learned there. Local community. Right? At, the, at the first aid uh, center here, there's the fire exclamation mark uh, joke. Uh, from the IT crowd that you, if, if you see a fire, you have to send an email with fire information. <laughs> right. <laughs> I will put this one here. This one says farming will move to more uh, dry crops, grains, and legumes. That's another long-term adaptation. Swiss glaciers melting. I'll put that under... Where was it? Sorry, sorry. It can cause floods and droughts. Floods, floods and droughts. Oh, fun. Let's put it there. Uh, tall buildings covered with green. That's a solution. I'll put that there. Farm turned into water buffers. That's a solution. That's great. More greenhouses, especially vertical. A solution. Farming done by machines. That's a thing there. Mass migration is a social. We'll keep that there. Flooding. We have flooding. We had droughts. Flooding was there. More civil action, great, let's put that there. I have wasp take over work from bees. That's an interesting one. That's ecosystem <laughs> function. Extreme heat, torrential rains, flooding, okay. Um, okay, so in retrospect, thanks for your input. We see, oh, there's one more, oh, thank you. Uh, less local fish, that's great. So where do I put that? Food, cost of water, food. What do we see? What, what have we seen? Let's look at this. We have our droughts. We have our fire, again, Im immediate problems, coupled with storms often. Uh, we talked about how to, what do you deal with that? Can you evacuate? Can you not evacuate? Um, I also heard very different things, right? Oh, I am in a, in a city, uh, heat waves are different than if I'm in a dry land, if I'm in the mountains. Um, there is the species food aspect, which is something we'll have to address and this is the one where being this one is hard not to be naive about because you cannot the amount of okay so if you are a hunter gatherer uh, uk which has about 80 plus million people can support about 80,000 people i've seen some papers claiming that that's a very significant difference in numbers so the idea i'll go in the woods in <coughs> southwest of the hague and gather my food. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, of course not. Like, just no. These concentrations don't work. So, how do you think about things like providing your own food if you know that you either physically are unable to do so because it takes hectares per person and lots of work and years of preparation and skill, which we, most IT people, I guess, don't have. I mean, I certainly don't. I mean, you know, it's a job, right? It's a skill. You need to know how to grow food. And my radishes get eaten by snails. Um, uh, how? And, you know, please. So, uh, yes, thanks. Just going back one step, but I just want to clarify when you're mentioning about the UK, about not necessarily having the resources to feed everyone. Is that, is, do you mean like because of the current production locally we have now, or do you mean like even if we utilize the land better, we would never have enough? The publications that I've seen were estimating if you are a hunter gatherer, if you literally live off the land by just looking around, trying to catch an animal, collect berries, the carrying capacity of the ecosystem to support human energy requirements of the entire country is about 80,000 people. This, this assumes no agriculture. It's like the extreme, we are literally just bands of roving humans doing... Yeah, when you got to get to be a ripe old age of 30, right? That's the... Um, so I want to move the ecological ones, this one, and the result. 
approximately. So then. So we'll try to summarize this at some point and put it online. Okay, so that's ecological, environmental, and of course, we'll wrap up and to sleep. Okay, so what I would like to do now is to keep, also in view of time, to repeat this exercise, but now bring it closer to home to us geeks and think about the techno political aspect of things. Right? So, this is the stuff that is just weather, it's going to be climate, it's going to be things that hit us. Um, let's try to think about the social, governmental, and the things around us. The machines, the software, the papers please aspect of things. Uh, what do we think in a world which is going through these kind of repeated frequent shocks that we either can handle but not so often or we never had to deal with before such as long-term extreme heat in the Netherlands we're not built for that we built for wet and cold not for that um, or like what you've seen in Texas uh, you're not built for freezing right you have everything set up to keep the, uh, the, the heat out not to keep it in so they went terribly wrong when they had month, weeks of freezing weather um, so let's think about what kind of world, if this is happening, if I've been flooded for the fifth time this year, or the seventh storm in three months has brought down again the roof and I'm trying to get the guy to come fix it, but he's fixing his own roof and everybody's roof is broken, now, now what? what does, how does this look like? Are we, does government come show up? Does military come show up? Uh, uh, it's a question, that, write it down, but. Does I've seen it in Brabant uh, then with the tornado there. The, the roofs were there not fixed for like five or six months. And yes, uh, but the Limburg, they uh, still are busy. They have uh, been busy for more than a year with fixing all the damage of the roofs. Please write that down because I would like to gather every, and then you can put there like very long or no help from. If that's the world, how you think that's a thing. Uh, also think in infrastructures, the systems around you, the roads, the power grid, can it handle it? Yes, yeah, so is that a useful exercise? Uh, can you just please. The question again? Like so my question is, please, again, in the same way like we did, identify things you expect to have to deal with in the techno socio government world. Do I still have internet? Uh, do, I still have do I have electricity? Do I can I call the police if something goes wrong? Do I think that's a f thing? Maybe it is, maybe, it's, maybe you think it's not. I would like to hear that. Um, and then I think we have a break and then see, use that to think about, okay, so now what do we do then? Okay, take a few minutes. If you need more pens. Yes, my, my pen disappeared, I don't know. Oh, I have one for you. Yeah. I should have a pen here. Uh, well, probably this one. Uh, I, I had the green one, so probably it was okay. this one. I don't know. You may have the green one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um. Because you only have so much food and you have to make sure you're going to sweat and you can 
only do that when you provide it by metrics. Because that's the rational, smart, and fair thing to do. Pretty pessimistic view, but it's, it's uh, not right. I'm, I'm just trying to yeah. yeah, it's not realistic. But that's exactly the thing, because you, I don't care if it's pessimistic. I want to have, is it probable? And so what do I do about it? If anything. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the shit talk. Something with shorter memory and lack of sleep, but yeah. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay, and then maybe just another photo, Claudia. Okay, okay. last call. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. One more, Igor. One more. Thank you. <laughs> Can you please take a photo? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I realized I don't want to be copy uh, tearing off more paper, so I just reorganize it on this board just to not waste more paper. Okay. Um, I'll st I'll move a few things down so that I can start up grouping them together. Let's just start here. No internet, no electricity, no phone. Okay. No. Uh -huh, no telecom, right? Uh, supermarkets empty or closed, survival of the fittest. That's bleak. Um, no water from the tap, yes. Let's just talk about this because I've seen it a few times already. The What's plausible? Temporary, and I'm not saying it's not, right? But just think about it. So we can, we, there is the something terrible happened, uh, things are disrupted. Is this a likely long-term no. thing? Short it's a short-term, right, which is fine. So let's then try to keep them short. I try to put a short-term here and a long-term there. So the, the long-term question is, how do I prepare for a unpleasant, relatively short-term disruption versus is it really, should I be preparing for the world where there's never more drinking water from my tap? living in a Western 
rich country. Is that a plausible scenario? Please. So when I'm thinking about this, yeah. I mean, if it, if it happens now, I think we will be fine. Uh, German government says uh, be prepared for 10 days without right. Like 10 days without running water. Right. I think we can, we can back up uh, everything quite quickly. We have emergency scenarios. But if this happens a lot of times, I mean, at some point, our, we won't have the money and, and the backup solutions because the backup solutions will have run out. Yes. And so I think at some point, there's no backup solution anymore. And, and so that's an interesting thought. Let's run with that. So you're, you are saying um, in a world where this keeps on happening and you still have a functional government, that's an assumption. So you have a government that somehow still is there. At some point they can't afford it. And if your government that cares is trying to do its best, what is then the, do they say, well, no money? Or interesting company you have over there, that's now mine. I mean, I'm not, do you think that's plausible? Because that's a thing where, again, I've, I've, I come from a country that has had war. And that's, a lot of these things are war situations. And then it's like, well, too bad, uh, democracy out of the window, we will do this, this is our, now ours, and you will work. Pay? How do you mean pay? You, will, you are working, you are going to be digging that channel, you will be fixing that pipe now. The end. And so that's fine. <laughs> no, it's not fine. But so in that scenario, which I think is a very likely one where you're like repeatedly being stressed, you cannot cope, you naturally, I think, and I'm curious what you think, end up in a very authoritarian government situation by necessity, not because they're necessarily evil. Also, people will help each other. It's, it's, people, uh, mm -hmm. people will help each other. Probably people will help each other and, and will... Uh, and there will be people who are fixing the pipes. Yes, that's even, very correct. Even without salary. Correct. Uh, I think that that in the situation where everyone is suffering, that there will be people who who will who will work uh, for others. That's exactly right, and we know that. We've seen that in war situations. We've seen in disaster situations. People are generally decent. In general. It's the few extremes that are annoying, but you're right. So it is always that how far do we believe that our societies will be able to stretch that and that, that you cannot keep up doing because you have to eat at some point and you can't go fix other people's pipes while your kids are hungry. So how does that, that going to work? I, I don't know, but that's a, right. Perhaps what, what can happen is that there are not enough people who, are, uh, who have the, the skills to, uh, to th do that kind of job. Excellent because point. Because we have a, here we have a really a, a, a society of managers and yep. well, I don't know, but uh, I think the most managers are, are not capable of, uh, of fixing uh, 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 some, uh, some water pipes. You're absolutely right. And this is, I'm glad you brought that up. So that as a long-term strategy, that's again our part two. Um, yes, please. I just want to add that in times of crisis, there is always a need to uh, restructure everything. So if you are, even if you are a manager, you become a plumber out of the need. Yes, but you have to have a plumber who can teach you what you need to know. Yeah, yeah, but that's... So if, if they're all gone or if they're all uh, busy elsewhere, it's, it's, no, it's no option. But and okay. you have to, to, to teach yourself. Yeah, but there, the, yeah. Okay. what I've seen yeah. during the times of crisis or during the times of war, that there are always people who can organize themselves because the government is failing or the government is occupied with something else. So, yeah, like you said, that there is some decency among human beings yes. still. The question always will be scale, but it's a very good question. Can you scale it up? Uh, you saw it uh, indeed in, uh, in Germany, but, uh, for example, last year uh, during the flooding. Yeah. And my big question for me always is, does this scale up? Because this works in an emergency in a city, in a region. What if whole Europe is like that? What if whole world is like that? How, how far can you stretch this? I don't know. We do know that from, there's a lot of literature on the aging problem of lack of skills. We see that in all sorts of, uh, you know, network comp energy network companies like, fine, I'll build that if I can get enough people, which they don't. Because first we're having you know, low, low birth rates, especially Europe. And who wants to be a tech because you can make more money as a manager? 
But so that's, you know, in terms of skills. Let's summarize this and then have a break. Uh, forced degrowth, very interesting. Notice the worst word forced, and you know what that means. A government that says, you shall not have this now. Like swim yeah. heating swimming pools in Germany. Or forced vegan diet, somebody wrote. Environmentally sound. Will you be voting for the political party that says everybody must be vegan? This is literally the only, pla only place where the answer is yay, I think. <laughs> but again, think about it, right? So in, in an environment that you normally live in, how will your neighbors react to something like that? I suspect not very favorably. Nope. Is it smart? Probably yes. yes. Well, it, will, it won't be an option anymore because there won't be any animals left. There might not be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's... <laughs> right? <laughs> so I have no power, no fresh water, no internet memes, oh no. Put it here. China plus eco fascism, state power, concentrate in cities. That's an interesting one. City concentration, that's humanity has been doing that. We are moving to cities more and more. Countryside is for outcasts in corporate food. Yeah. Somebody been playing um, Cyberpunk 2077? <laughs> I have, but yeah. That's, you're right. Um, it's interesting to observe what China is doing because they have, compared to most other countries, an exceptionally high degree of ability to. Organize. You can disagree with the methods extensively. You cannot argue with the results. They also, I remember that Friday, that's when you're a nerd like me who worries about these things, there was a Friday that the Chinese government announced from today on you can only buy neodymium magnets. We will not sell you neodymium metal or neodymium ore. Now, neodymium, you're nerds, you know. And they, they have bought most South, Africa, South American mines. They have priced out all the American mines and made sure that they are bankrupt and have full oh. monopoly on neodymium yeah. neo right now. And before the US industry has reestablished itself, that's not going to happen. And they basically said, no more ore for you. And withdraw ore from American production, killed American production of neodymium, and they monopolized fully now. And only sell end products. No, uh, Long term, very smart. Tra I mean, it's it's evil as hell, and I wish I could pull it off. It's sort of, as in, right? I'm being flippant, but you get it, right? So it's really effective, and Western governments are probably not able to pull that kind of coordination off, for better or worse. I mean, the only way you can do it is you, you have to be willing to like maintain the capacity. I mean, right, at cost, below cost, at in societal investment, exactly, and no Western capitalist environment allows for that. Right. Absence of social services after major disasters capacity. Right. Again, I'll keep it here with the, oh, this is short term. I'll move that there because that's the long term. No internet. I'll move that there. We already have that. Breakdown of payment systems. Oh, that's, the, oh God, yeah, okay. Break, uh, breakdown of payment systems. There will be Jackie, what's her last name? She's, uh, team, she's the lead of Team Waste. She's uh, um, from Iceland and does banking system modeling as a scientist. She'll talk about this. She's going to have this. a talk uh, at, uh, I think it's tonight, at, uh, no, tomorrow night at Clare... Clare Convoyance, yeah. And so she's an expert on financial systems and modeling. So if you care about that, go talk to her, look at the talk. She, yeah. We convinced her to submit one. Um, Clairvoyance, uh, uh, yes. Uh, Clairvoyance, yeah. yes. Yellow. I don't know how to say uh, The very long re uh, repair time for parts, for yeah, repairs, maintenance. I'll put that. Is that uh, the same thing as uh, this morning? About uh, that morning? No, that's a whole different thing. This is about financial systems specifically. Um, in? In the CV, yeah, can you please? In superior heat stroke, we can't, cannot bury the dead. Oh, we cannot bury the Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, uh, yeah. If it's 10 days. There is a, um, one second, there, there is a science fiction book from, uh, what's his name? Uh, Line of Polity has, uh, no, yeah, the owner series. Oh, my God, what is it? Some, somebody some, does something and then 4 billion people die instantly because of some implants or something and then he, talk, he talks about the ecological disaster of having four billion corpses on the planet it's 
it's not fun. It really made me think of that. But there is that, like, what do you do with biomass that just, uh, okay. Jesus Christ, okay, what this kind of conversation? Uh, come in. Sorry? Please. Oh, yeah, sorry, apologies. I'm That's okay. So uh, I had the second no internet one. Yep. Um, and I drilled down a little bit more because it's yep. also, you know, no Netflix, no entertainment, people are going so crazy. Going right, crazy. Right. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons that, you know, Corona wasn't so bad was that everybody sat in front of the TV and watched TV. But what if there's no TV? What if people have to read books all of a sudden or play cards? Um, it's and I'm curious what you think about interesting that scenario. One of my buddies is an American d divorce lawyer in Florida. And he said the first thing that happened uh, like after the first half year of COVID is the divorce rates went, went down. They dropped like a rock. And first everybody was like, oh, but that's amazing. And then they realized, oh, no, that's terrible. Because people don't dare to get divorced. And so people stay in abusive relationships because it's so much insecurity. They can't afford to leave. And it's actually a very bad thing. And so indeed, the, what they've seen is divorces went up battery and domestic violent cases have gone up. And it's been, I mean, they, they, you can just tell, you just got the graphs. So yeah, the, the, it's, it's, and then you also know who's essential, right? It's the people on, right? Yeah. Uh, kids miss lots of school. That's a very important long-term thing. What do we do when we have systematic disruption of education? Right, you've seen that now with COVID, it's not a good thing. I mean, I have kids at school, it was no fun. It's not good for them. They're desocialized, they need to relearn how to be Friends, it's not good. Authoritative governments, no democracy. Yeah, that's, we'll put that there. No clean water infrastructure breakdown, That keep that there. People noticing the limits, failures of capitalism and infinite growth. Yeah, that's, let's hope. Well, people notice. Uh, if water becomes scarce, no concrete, no construction. Somebody there. Government restrict to buy items, so we put that on the government control. It's one of those things again. Uh, people were bitching when EU limited the maximum power of a uh, water kettle and of the vacuum cleaner. I don't know if you caught that at some point, right? And it's like, oh, my freedoms, and I need a three kilowatt kettle. Do you? <laughs> right. Um, technological development pause. So that's interesting. We do know also that humanity never wastes a good crisis in general. And that's a very interesting one. So does it mean that development stops? If you look at major wars, they were major, major pushes because then YOLO, anything goes. What now, ethics? And so as terrible as it is, a lot of the advances happened because of Nazis locking up Jews and experimenting, which is terrible, but we found out things you would have never found out about because they're extremely unethical to test. Right? NASA is half former rocket scientist. Right? But it's also not unheard of for us to lose technology and not find it again for 800 years or more, right? That has happened. I've actually, I've actually <laughs> done a master student, a student with, with some archaeologists who looked at a 13,000 years ago, there was a explosion of a volcano in the northwestern Europe somewhere that covered ash change local climate and they have historic records of tribes forgetting how to make bows and arrows. Mm. So there's precedent that we could go backwards. Right, and, and the, the interesting thing there is, and that's the thing that makes me really worried, is the how much tech you need to make tech to make tech, right? How much, I have to be able to make steel if I ever gonna make a chip fab even though not a lot of steel goes into it, but the layers of stuff I need to be able to, and that bootstrapping, once you start losing certain levels, will be very interesting. Especially if the you know, rare and special things are required. So that's interesting. So do you, do you have a chip fab low level one in the hackerspace? And also with uh, things like the uh, they didn't use those in America because they don't know how to use them. Right. And there's a lot, lot of tacit knowledge locked in society which then starts becoming difficult to access. So when we talk about robust strategies, do you run a backup of Wikipedia on your home server just because? You know, yeah, maybe you do because you just want to have access to that knowledge if you don't have internet. No drinking water, that's under the emergency stuff. Pause, we had no internet due to heat energy shortage. Cars cannot drive because they need internet. Oh, God, yeah. 
There's that. <laughs> Not, yeah, we had the barrier. Okay. So what have you seen? Sorry, yes. yes, please. Oh yeah, did they miss something? That one? Yeah. Yes, thanks for this, guys. The, which one? This one? Yes. Okay, so we have here no food, water, internet, no med medical, right. Thanks for that. There is, um, especially when you are taking life-preserving chronic home education that you need to keep on taking, that's a thing. I just want to share a story of just how bad this gets. It's a, um, I take certain pills that I at that time could not stop. I have to continue because side effects for psychosis and suicide, which is like, you don't want to just do that. Um, it's not, you know, it's one of those extreme things, but, and um, I'm a professor at the university. My mother is a psychiatrist in Switzerland. Okay, I have connections. I'm a white dude, middle-aged. I can pull strings. And one day I show up at the pharmacy, give me my pills, because I was forgot that they were like, no, we, there, there aren't any. They just ran out. I'm like, I have two more days, and then, then I go crazy. Like, we don't have them, because supply chain Brexit, something happened. It took me 48 hours to get it organized. And I have a psychiatrist in the family who can write a recipe. I have it FedExed, and I'm rich enough to afford that. And it was a lot of effort, a lot of stress, being at the top of the I can push it off pyramid. And now you're a single mom with two kids, no job, black, Muslim. Well, you're laughing, right? But that's, no, no, I know, but that's, that's really bad. That's really bad. And then you ran out of life saving medication, and the doctor goes, I want to help you, but now what? And that's, that's, that to me was really sobering. It's just how much effort it took me to, to fix something that's extremely easy for me to fix compared to most people. Like, holy cow, how do you even, how do we as a society deal with such things? And, you know, so I stopped taking that medication. I take different ones that I can stop if I have to. That's an adaptation that's, you know, no transport. Obviously. Absolutely. So, if you have, uh, yeah. if, you, if you have diabetes, you can't, you can't stop. You can. Or if you need uh, oxygen, you can't swim. Exactly. So, exactly. So then the question is, if you're in that situation, what is, what can you do? I, I don't know. I just want to raise that point and to really, because you, know, you know your local situation, but what, what can I do? And it does, you, know, you might want to have some supplies, you want to have some buffers if you can. What in the long run? Please. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, a related thing is how do, how do we learn from these things? So we mentioned Germany before and people helping and there was this flooding and then the insurance companies paid out and the government decided we're gonna rebuild everything just like it was before. And really just like it was before. In the same areas that flooded, we're going to rebuild these houses so that way when the next storm comes, we can rebuild them again. Of course, telling people to move you know, go someplace else is also kind of mean, but it seems to me like we had this great effort, there was um, a horrible situation, people came together, and then we didn't learn anything. But we can rebuild in a, in a different way. Rebuild in different we can, ways. We can, uh, we can rebuild the, the buildings, but uh, also build some, uh, uh, well, some areas where, where the water can go. So, just to, to react to that, it, this is the, the, the difficulty about I think oh, this whole thing is that not that we ca that not that there is no solution. Because as smart, intelligent people, we can come up with solutions, but do we expect them to actually be implemented? Well, and then the answer is no. Right. Much, much less damage, still too much damage, much less than in Germany. Right, so then the question is, okay, given your institutional, legal, political context, what can you expect to be the response? If you look at UK, uh, where I looked at the flooding there, the, they call it the elevator effect, which is this really uh, weird thing where because you build protection, the 
formula used to assess risk lowers the risk, with the, which says, oh, now I can build because insurance is cheaper because I built, value at risk goes up. So, so you have to build more protection, which then lowers the risk, you build more. And it's like, what the fuck? We are doing exactly the wrong thing. But from that logic, this is the logical thing to do. Keep on building where you shouldn't be building. Uh, and nice experience experiment at this very moment is moving Jakarta up the mountain a little bit in right. Indonesia. Right, so how do you move a city? Yeah. Can you organize it? They also switch the main capital. Or yeah, they're, they're switching actually the capital. They're switching yeah. the capital. Yeah. So yeah. some countries yeah. seem to get it. Yeah. Right, and if you know that your environment will not have that ability to adapt and build better, what does that mean for you then? Do you then preemptively start, you know, your next house will not be in there, there if there is a next house? Should there be a next house? Can you even? I, I, I don't know. I, we don't know. So, yes, please. So there's one more I want to go over very quickly and skip. Uh, so just around, around like food shortages, really. Yes, food shortage, okay. So in the UK, we import most of our food. Yes. So we couldn't feed our own population just from our agriculture. Yes, we cannot. Presumably, if these other countries where you're from, they have agricultural problems caused by climate change, the first thing they want to do is stop exporting and keep the food. So uh, you're seeing that exactly right now with grain. There's actually a website that's tracking all of the different food export bans. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there's around, generally this year there's around 30 countries with some form of food export ban at any given time and then another like less than 10 that have some other weird restriction. And then, but the actual number of products is a bit more, maybe 40 or something. Anyway, but it seems... The, the, it's happening, right? It started this year, started tracking it, but you can watch that and get an idea how this is going to keep growing. Yeah, so just for the recording, so there are websites which we don't have URL right now that track food bans, food, food export bans. And that's again a logical, rational response to if you're a co government and you need to make sure your people uh, have to eat, you will not sell your food anymore, which is too bad for everybody else who's buying it. And that's that degradation at that level to parochial protection because it's just logical. They're not evil, necessarily. Uh, they might be also evil, but, uh, you know, right. Um, yeah, so what do we have? We had a few of these direct disruptions, short-term emergency stuff. So for this, I would say for these kinds of things that are short-term, we know how to deal with. You got your UPSs, you have your live straws to filter your water, get a family pack size, they're not very expensive. I did the math there, I have them at my home. Uh, they look, because in, again, uh, in Holland, I will have water, <laughs> right? Quality, I don't know, but I will have water regardless. So how do I get clean water? Get a family sized live straw, I can filter 25 cubic meters. I could drink with family of four for a year or more if I only had to drink. So that's fine. If you're in a place where do I have water, then you have a whole different problem. So. Uh, these kinds of things, and if you take the muscle of ladder of needs, I need to breathe every minute, no, every couple of seconds. Then I need to drink every couple of days, I need to eat once a week, and then I need shelter and all of those things. So you need to have that stuff sorted out on the emergency response side just because of the first 10 days. Then there is the, what you've seen here is authoritative centralized control, that seems to be a very common theme, for better or worse, and I, I find that an interesting list because Lots of the policies, I'm like, yeah, we should probably do that. But, yeah, when we start forcing people to be vegan, that's going to be fun. And then we have more cultural, you know, how do we deal with capitalism? I have no idea. Education. Supermarket supply chains, food supplies, always big, big thing. Okay. Maybe we have a photo of the sli slightly organized thing. And I would propose a break. I'm also just very tired, maybe 10 minutes. And then I would like to sli finish up with a more focused session on, okay, so what are the things we can do as community, as individuals, in terms of action? And then we can pick up some of these things. Yeah? Uh, say 10 minutes.
Okay, so welcome back. Thank you for coming back. It's always a fun to actually see the audience return, which is... <laughs> <laughs> breaks are critical. You never know. And that's my test with lectures, you know, in the halfway, because you usually teach two hours after one after the other, and halfway, it's like nobody comes back. Anyway, so let's do the final exercise. Um, and let's use um, different colors just to keep things separate. So let's say... What, how, what do we have? We have blue, yellow, and red? Yeah. Pink. Pink-ish. So let's do yellow for short-term things, and let's do anything that's not yellow for long-term things. Just So that's one for separation, and we'll hand that. Please share. So use bright for short, uh, bl uh, dark for long. Yellows. Do we have blue there? Yeah. What is short and long? I, I, I'll, I'm getting there. <laughs> So what I would like to do now is, because we talked about the socio-technical stuff going wrong, more the ecological, environmental stuff going wrong, let's think about what can you do? What are the things to, to, to learn, to train, to teach, to organize? What the, let's keep it as close home as we can, because societally we kind of all know, but that's all the stuff that's not... It's useful, but not something that's actionable that will help me in my daily life. And that's what I would like to get out of here is, can we get some form of grip? So what are the things that are short-term actions and activities that we can do? What's your definition of short-term? Yes, that's an next. Thank you for that question. Uh, no, I would want to keep it even shorter. That would be the, I have to deal with an emergency caused by climate change and whatever. So food running out, my medicine's running out, uh, I, whatever, I'm being flooded, my r roof blew off. These kinds of things. And the long terms are, what do, what do I teach my kids? What kind of skills do I want them to have to live in a world that's going to experience maybe well-meaning but authoritarian governments that's going to mean disruptive economic systems, that's going to mean you know, access to limited information, all of those things. So long-term skills, long-term behaviors, whatever comes to mind versus more short-term oriented things. It's in Yeah, it's Nihon. Yeah, please, uh, can we have more darker ones, long-term ones? Oh, here, okay. Yes, yep, there we go. Yeah, the block need us. That sounds like, a, seemed like a good idea, those papers, but, or we have to use more plastic. Oh, yeah, well, I can Darker stuff will be, can we please have more of the blue ones? May I please have that stack there? Yep, yep thanks. Okay, I'll give you a few more, <coughs> a couple of there. There are some more darker ones here. I'll split the stack there for you as well. And yeah, yellow, bright color, if you can grab it, something short and a darker color for the long term. And think about things you would like to learn because you think it's useful to know because it will help you deal with change. Things that you will t teach your kids or I should teach my kids. Things you wish your neighbor knew. And if it's something very specific to your situation, please add in which situation does this make sense? Like, I want to learn how to do permaculture, that's great, but that means I have to have a place to do permaculture. So if I live in a flat, that's not very useful. Doesn't mean it's... Never... I mean, if you think that's a useful thing, please put it down. Yeah? Yes, okay. So I'll put...
behaviors. Let's just look at it because there I see many different things. Let's look at the short-term things. Uh, degrowth yourself today. Could the person who wrote this just clarify a bit more? Yes, please. Um, it's a matter of thinking how how we could use less resources. What I'm uh, not doing maybe. How I'm not uh, doing myself sufficiently because if tomorrow we are going to have a partial collapse or uh, mm -hmm. problems. Uh, the less you need and the less you're using, the more prepared you're going to be. And also mm -hmm. the exercise itself of thinking and uh, going through, the, through uh, less resources prepares yourself for that scenario. So the question is, let's think about what do you really need. Yeah. Right, do I need that third game computer or... Right. Do I need that, that server in my closet? Uh, with of course you do. <laughs> 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 All three of them, yeah. Yeah. Okay, weapon stashing and or 3D printing them. I I get it. It's the Americans have uh, plenty proven that it's not a real viable solution. <laughs> and to be contrary, I would say it also helps. It also helps, and that, that's I, I don't know. It's a th strange thought, right? Because you know people will be dicks as well at some point. And so well, what's that balance? Because especially when things get ugly, how do you balance that out? You know, you cannot go full US because that doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry for the Americans. No, no, I'm specifically <laughs> just rela responding to, to weapons, right? Because a society that's so weaponized is just going to be scary. On the other side, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's a very tough moral question because you don't want to be defenseless. You want to be, you know, you're going to protect your family. Of course you will. No, it's, I'm glad you brought it up. It's it's scary, but switch to work close to home. I'll move that to more long term, but I get it. Vocally, publicly oppose CC. Uh, yeah, climate change denial. If you have the nerve and energy, yes, please. Thank you. Aikido. There we go. <laughs> Unarmed defense. No, that excellent point. Uh, this one, vocal, vocal. There is always a worry, though, that people who don't want to believe will never ever want to understand and. You see it in Europe, you see it very much in the US. It's so extremely polarized because of various reasons. 
breaking that, you know, there's basically no point anymore because they will not listen to you. I, I, I see the point as not necessarily, uh, not necessarily trying to you convince people who are already climate change deniers not to do that, but to try to make sure that if you're in a, in a society, well, we're all in a society, if you're in a particular uh, group of people, a particular discussion, making sure that they don't stand unopposed. So no right. one's going to hear that and think, oh, that sounds reasonable. Right. No one's disagreeing with it. So it's the it. continuous anti-voice of keeping it loud. I agree yeah, with that. stopping yeah. it from spreading. Civil disobedience, very much so I agree. Uh, very much depends on can you, do you dare, uh, do you have the ability to actually go and be chained into a fence? Sometimes it works. Um, save a three kilo beaver, okay? Um, do not buy ice cream from the North Pole, fair enough. Learn as many languages, I like this one. Uh, I don't know why it's, it's shorter, I'll move it to long term, I think that makes sense, but I like it as a communicate, right? It's the more you communicate, the better, and across cultures, that's always hard. 3D printing of false teeth, I think that's really nice. <laughs> Things you can. I mean, these are the things that, you know, imagine you are in a barter economy where you can't, the payment system is down, and, you know, you can make teeth, and people need that. And you're making, you know, I don't know. Life straws, yeah, that's an emer emergency preparedness, basic stuff. Uh, life straws are these field, yeah, right. Simple things. I have strap-on bands for, like, these uh, ratchet bands because I carry lots of loads. Last storm, I just brought them out of my car because, I don't know, I was, I was paranoid and I ended up strapping down my shed. It did not fly off. It's like just have, you have a shed that could fly, have things to tie down in case of. It worked, I saved my shed. Um, looked really funny with like tape. Uh, organize local communities, yes, awesome, volunteer. This is stuff touches people's lives and that's, you help somebody, they will always remember that and they might come back and, you know, Open source is viral, community building is viral. And think about these things, that's great. Even though I would not put it here because that's a long-term thing, but it's a very good strategy. Have a amount of water plus food in your house, have supplies, medicines, yep, that's basic. And think it through, basic emergency response is just smart. I mean, literally the government, is, you know, Dutch government has a list, have these things. Those lists are stupid. They are not, there is some very dumb things on there. But as nerds, we can, debug that and maybe make them make op, you know, open source emergency preparedness per region or per situation. Because one for a flat, flat dweller single person is different than a family of six in the boonies. And they, are, they need to be, yeah. Change career to sustainability. If you can afford, yes. Uh, get uh, an old fashioned GSM because uh, you, have, uh, you might need you it. Don't have to, you don't have to load them so, so Right, have old tech also, which I appreciate that. So have low tech available because you never know. And not hoard them, but have a few just in case. Yeah. Change of careers, not for everybody available, obviously, but that's if you can, because if it feels better, you're going to be more enjoying it. You'll be doing something meaningful. Um, it's also long term, isn't it? It's a long term, yes, please. It's I, try to, I try to change my career. Okay, so I'll keep it short. Right. So I'm in the, the process of changing my career. There you go. There is, so what I've seen from psychological research on this is autonomy, mastery, and sense of purpose. The three things you need, right? And it's the sense of purpose often lacking in most corporate jobs because you're just buying somebody bigger fucking yacht, right? And autonomy is lacking, in, but sense of purpose. That's why I stay in academia for me. That's how it works for me. Yes. Autonomy, mastery, and sense of purpose. So you want to be free to, to act, you want to be good at what you're doing, and it has to mean something. And that last one is maybe the most important one, because if it's meaningful, then you will accept much less because you know why you're doing it. If it's meaningful, then the salary doesn't really matter for me. If it's... Yeah. If it's high enough to sustain my... That's a very important if, because, yeah. and, and what sustaining means is very different. Yeah for different people, and that's something that really matters, you know, what your local situation is, right? That connects you degrowth. Degrowth, very much so. That's also that attitude, right? Do you need new stuff, or are you, do, is having second-hand furniture a virtue? Because why spend money, right? Uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, playing football in a refugee camp. Fo football? I don't, what's that? Football. Um, 
that that's me, that was me. Uh, somebody said like meditate, what skills do you need in a refugee camp? And that was one of them. So what is football? Oh, like just football. Ah, oh, right. I, I thought you meant football. So there was a. No, 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 no. I thought you meant something different with it. Okay. Another one. Learn to spell. Uh, no. So <laughs> like uh, to to play with other people in order to make like connections. That. And I think that's a you know can you survive in a refugee camp? Yeah. Because that's that's a shitty you know this is how humans are shitty to other humans, and can you handle that? And then it's not fun if you see what's going on there. Yep. Uh, Monetize climate solutions. I will. Yeah, that's. A I like this one. Think about business models that make people make uh, help people make money by saving the planet. If you can do that, you will be very very rich, which is glorious, right? Said the Chinese. But how do we make saving the world extremely profitable? Masa is casa. Masa is casa, yeah, right. So, um, inform, repair for local emergencies, yeah, there is that. Sustainable travel, hitchhiking, if that's an option for you, do it. Go to farm with kids. Short water, oh yeah, uh, there are some uh, uh, water, manning, do I see skills? So how do I build filters, filter my water, community building, community... Uh, Food kitchens, first aid, first aid, basic things. Just take a first aid course. I still have to do it. So local communications at VHF. Yes, v uh, VHF. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's on my list. Learn how to become a ham operator. Not because I care about radio, but because yeah, you never know, right? And it's you know geeky. Have supply. Oh, we had that. So emergency preparedness. Um, inform out, reduce, deregulate. Oh, that's a long-term one. Anything I missed? No, that's, I think, fine. <laughs> Long term, stimulate curiosity in my kids. Yes, please, teach. Go out and teach. Do coder dojos. Do whatever. Reach out to kids. Learn them to learn. Teach them to learn, absolutely. That's very, very important. Get them into the simple things you can do. Um, um, collect old waste uh, ma machines, electronics, and then have a day with the community and just tear them open. Nothing, you don't have to repair anything, just open it, sit there with your kids and open things up, look at them. I won as a parent. There you go, right? I decided I won as a parent when my uh, then, what, seven year old came downstairs and said, the PS4 controller is broken, where's the screwdriver? Not like I want a new one, no, where's the screwdriver? because he grew up in hackerspace. And that's, of course, you just open things up. And then I've blown kids' minds by just giving them a screwdriver and an old toaster. And they were like, you can open it? I was like, oh, yeah. And when you're in this community, you really forget how weird we are in the sense that, of course, you're going to open it up. And get kids in that mindset, because it's fixable, right? Teach kids to enjoy free things in life. Yes, experiences. Switch to working close to home, <laughs> if you can. Boycott non-sustainable. I want to, st I want to st uh, pause at this one. There's a huge amount of corporate shaming of consumers. It's very easy for Shell to say, oh, we should all drive green. No, fuck you guys, no, clean up your act. There's a lot of pushing into individual responsibility, but there, for that, it means that there has to be choice. And if I'm a single mom on welfare and I have four kids, I will buy the cheapest bio industry meat for my kids because they're growing. They're, I want them to eat meat because they need protein. I cannot afford to be sustainable because I have no money. And then you get guilt on top of that. So this one is very tricky because how, what can you boycott? And can you afford to boycott? And this is for rich people. And yes, do it, but don't shame people into it. And a lot of the well-meaning woke crowd will go crazy on that and shame people who can't afford to do that. And being poor is expensive, you know that. Right? Poverty traps and you buy an old inefficient washing machine because you have a couple of kids which then uses a lot of power, uses a lot of energy, 
breaks off and you have to, but you will never be able to afford to buy a mille of 2,000 euros because. Right. And a person who has so much on their head is dealing with these things, cannot afford to think about these things. So how do we help people who, who cannot afford to be picky? That's, that's hard. Community. Right, but then that has to be there. It's a community. Right. Well, for example, one thing I do, I volunteer every now and then with a the repair cafe. And if you don't have a repair cafe, start one. Repair cafe basically has been announced that there will be a group of people fixing stuff on Saturday morning in the community center. Come bring your thing. You can bring one device and we'll try to fix it. If not, then we'll just dispose of it. And the number of tears of joys I created just by replacing a fuse is just shocking. Because if you're, I mean, you're a nerd, you literally just unscrew it, you retighten the thing, and people go, oh my god, this was my, and I'm not exaggerating, my, my, my husband recently died, this was his favorite radio, and now it stopped working, and now it works again. Everyone's just crying. <laughs> Fuck. Now, things are weird, and what did you do? Yeah, unscrew a screw, right? Plant medicine. Yes? This stupid, but it's like, a, I just learned, learned how plants work, and how can they can help you, actually. You know? Geek out on, on that, right? I mean, you know, uh, what if paracetamol runs out? Well, you go find a willow and chew on it. <laughs> because salicyl salicylic acid comes from willows, yeah? And the hydrogen uh, trava, a helium, uh, milliflores, chew on that. Lots of, right? So why not? I mean, it's, uh, is it going to make you more stupid if you know your local biology and what's useful? No. Yeah. That's a thing to learn. But you don't do that when you are trying to save your life because of a storm, right? So you need to prepare. Um, how to cook healthy, yeah. Public open load supply chains, oh my god, yeah. Pasha Mama, um, can somebody elaborate? That's you, right? So it's like a figure of Mother Earth, Earth that's used in Latin America. Okay. So don't upset Pasha Mama, don't take too much from her. Okay, that's an interesting way, thank you. Uh, what do we have? Local pockets of information, P BBS, private, skill sharing. Yeah, I mean, start a hackerspace if you don't have one. Just that, because if people know where to come to, to, to learn. Um, universal knowledge repositories, yes. Um, pirate, more scientific papers. Absolutely. Uh, run copies of Wikipedia. All the stuff that you know to do because you're a nerd anyway, you have that server in your cabinet, do something useful with it. Um, teach my kids to have survival skills, sure, why not? Alternative economic models for, for distributing what you do have. If you're in a, you know, if your job is supply chain management and you have these choices, yes, then do that. Uh, what else do we have? Permaculture. Learn about permaculture. Awesome. Farming. More oriented to dry crops. We talked about that. Or organize local communities. Volunteer. Teach meditation for compassion. Part of communities. Yeah. Start involving your kids when you make. Decisions. Wise decision. Okay. Vote for green policies. Yes. How to build local networks, neighborhoods. You mean whoever wrote this? You mean technically or socially? Both of them. Okay. Know your neighbors. I like the point. You, you knew your neighbor's phone number. I don't. I should probably work on that. No, oh, but that's brilliant. It's that, you know, know your neighbors. Um, capture more CO2 than currently emits. Yeah. Excellent idea. Okay, so with things like this, again, the matter of scale comes in, right? It is. Right. So that's part of that. There is. We overestimate the amount of control I think we have on our emissions. I don't know where the paint pigment that went into this plastic bottle came from. I can't control that. I can buy a reusable bottle, but uh, I can't control that. So there's a lot, a vast majority of impact is also behind the consumption. Yeah. But that reusable bottle actually used 65% of the energy to create a new one also. So in this case, reused. this is obviously good, right? But yeah, there but, are... But it's still 65% on top of the 100% used to create it in the first place. Okay, so like plastic, so I'll use less plastic, fine. Netherlands burns all of it waste, right? UK landfills, Netherlands burns everything. No, they don't. Well, it's law. I mean, you, you're not allowed to. 
Well, yeah, but vast majority is burned. Let's not go into details, right? The point being that since plastic has been recycled and paper is being recycled, the caloric heat value of Dutch waste has gone down, which means that we have to burn oil when we're burning waste to keep the temperatures high enough because otherwise we get dioxins because chlorine is in everything. And dioxins, you look at them at 100 meter distance, you get cancer. So you really don't want dioxins in your environment. And when the temperature is below 600 Celsius, they form. So we solved it, but then we, so is burning plastic a bad idea? Yes and no, right? Because you need that oil. So it's delayed oil, right? I'm not advocating burning more plastic, but it, you get these weird interactions in the back end. There is so much demand for recycled paper in Sweden that they cut down trees, make paper, then shred it. Now it's called recycled and it's recycled and then sold as recycled paper. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Right? So you think you're doing the right thing. And so you have no idea. You can't know. Which is like, really? Uh, but yeah. What I mean is something else. I, I mean, uh, sell your car, don't fly. That flying, yeah. Kind of you don't want that, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, don't, don't buy a new smartphone. Uh, okay. uh, look if you're, if you're uh, uh, if your furniture has to be replaced or it's still working, uh, yep. can, you buy, can you buy second hand, that, that kind of things. Because, for, for example, furniture, there's a lot of second hand furniture yep. available. Agreed. People die, uh, they have high quality uh, things in the house, but uh, they don't know where to, to, to put that, those yep. things. Don't eat animals. That, that, <laughs> that's impact on the planet. Yeah. It's, it's those, those, don't, don't, don't eat meat. Flying and yeah. that's the two things that matter most. And then things like turning off the lights. If you have LEDs, nobody cares. It's it's symbolic. It's it's the uh, anyway. Just how's we doing with time? Okay. So um, as a recap, and then I'll let you go. Um, we have a bunch of very useful. You have a photo, right? Yeah. We have a bunch of useful stuff. I think the the differs who you are, depends what you can do, but you can do a lot. And I've seen a lot of community, which I really appreciate. A lot of teaching, a lot of lifestyle. And the weird thing with these things is it doesn't matter what you do, and it also matters a lot what you do. And that's the big paradox of individuals in groups, is that, that could, you could be that one person that triggers, but that trigger can only happen when there is sufficient amount. Now, there is soci sociological research that says if you can get 3.5% of the population to agree on something, you can change society. You can change society. You can fundamentally cause revolutions. Eleven. So I've heard three and a half. There you go. Fair enough. Whether whether that actually works, we don't know. But it, you might need less people than you think that are that agree and focus. So organize. That's I think the message here. I said sell your car, and I think also 11 percent of the of the population would sell their car, don't buy a new one. We don't. We, we need much less uh, parking uh, True. Uh, places. Uh, and, uh, and you can you can you can solve them. You can solve the mobility with uh, with shared vehicles. Uh, Sometimes. And uh, that's absolutely agreed. And again, it's very context dependent. Where you are, who you are, can you afford to sell your car? That's, I, I cannot say you must do that, but it's probably not a bad idea. But only if you can. We've done a lot. So if you look at, in retrospect, we, yes, sir? No, no, yeah. We have a nice list of, nice, terrible list of things that we expect. Have a look, come back to this. Think, think for your situation what's important. Many things might not matter, some might matter a lot. What does that mean? See if you can for yourself find things that you're like, yeah, I can see this happening to me. How do I, can I use any of these things? Yes, please take photos. We'll put them on the wiki as well. Any final thoughts before we close for you guys? Just thank you for working so hard. Um, you mentioned the wiki. Um, Emergent.earth. Okay, okay. Claudia runs that and she'll be putting up these things up and then anything else you want to... There's also the reading, there is material over there that you can read about that's also available as PDFs, very legal. So as you can download what is here on the table and download from the wiki? 
And uh, we are just adding things that, uh, yeah. that happens. Yeah. But what, what are you doing? So, add things if you want. One second, please. What, what are you doing with, uh, with all this? We, we collected a lot of things. We put it on the wiki. But um, uh, the, are there any actions you you perform to uh, to make people do all those things? I cannot make anybody do anything. I can hardly make myself do things. What is the symbol of this? Excellent point. The, the reason why I did this exercise is because I did something similar for myself to give me some peace of mind. And I've, I personally learned there are some very interesting things I haven't thought about before. So for me, that's win because my list now grows of things to consider and some things to think about. Um, I hope that it does, works for you the same way, to help you give a slightly different angle to the same thing. Um, what do you want to follow up? It's up to you. It's, uh, I can help you bring it together and then share these things. And if you want to pick it, pick it up and run with it, by all means, please do so. You, you mentioned last night in your talk at the end, like, um, I drive a, an old diesel yes. car and I'm not going to replace it. I, I, I'm not able to. Yeah, I can't. But I'm personally working on this project with the government or some yep. big company Except, yeah. and they use a megaton of gas yeah. or something like that. Yeah, yeah, massive. That, that you personally can do. Yep. And when I hear you say that, I think, well, how could I do that? No, that's no but you can do other things. Example, but you can do other things. Yeah. Any of these things. Because we have different skill sets, different experiences, and the skill that I think that the challenge is really look at this and say, well, what are the things where I feel I can make a difference? And that could be at any level. That Because there's no point of comparing yourself in that sense to other people because you're not me and I'm not you, right? So but it's, it's a tricky thing, right? So, of course, I also have, I'm in a particularly privileged uh, position. I'm very well educated. I have a, a fair amount of uh, money, so I can do things. But um, what about other people? How can we generalize this? Because you mentioned also this idea of shaming people to do something, like don't use straws. If you use a straw, then yeah, such you bullshit. Yeah, the yeah. environment. Right. right. Kids also brought this home when I'm talking about Okay, I don't know about that. It's one of, one of those divergent strategies to dis distract people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it, of course, don't use plastic as you can avoid it, but it's such a little scapegoat that people pick up on or industry picked up on. Like, look, we're doing something. Yeah, but how, how can we tease this apart from the, the things that kind of don't matter, the things that do matter, and things that, we, that are actually attainable for sort of normal people? <laughs> By doing these kinds of attempts, hey, yeah. please. If you have an, in, yeah. So, question. So, one thing that um, so there's there's an awful lot of students who go to study engineering. Yep. Uh, a typical engineering student, not a typical one, but a, quite a large portion of them don't know what they actually want to do. Yep. One thing that probably would make some sort of sense is for engineering schools, if you can get engineering schools to start and um, essentially teach. A, a more uh, have a, a, a track which is which teaches a breadth of things ranging from low tech to other things and whatever. The same could be said with biology and whatever. So yep. Essentially, what you do is you wedge in a you wedge in an educational program essentially that that is basically designed to so that you know you know that more of the people coming out with these degrees are not completely dependent on being shoved into a complex supply chain. Uh, that works for me, and I've, we've done that. I've helped set up an industrial ecology master's program that's about sustainability. So, but that's my, you know, that that's my sphere of influence. And if you're in tech, maybe I don't know. Let's imagine you are responsible for ordering a server farm. But probably maybe you can make sure that it is certified, you know, renewable code.